we're going to get started. So um, good evening and welcome to the second discussion of our community conversation series for this year. Uh, this is um, who can live here, who decides and why. That's tonight's panel discussion and it'll be focusing on fair housing in Arlington. Um, this is hosted by the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Division, and I'm Jill Harvey, the Director of that division in the Department of Planning and Community Development. Um, I'll be going over some ground rules and expectations for the night before introducing some of our guests and getting started. Um, additionally, I want to tell you know that closed captioning is available for this program, so please use the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enable it. I'd also just like to remind everyone that we do have a certain amount of time for this event. So we'll be going from seven to nine. Um, so we will do our best to address any questions during the Q&A segment of this program, which will take place in the later half of the discussion. We do ask that you use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, versus using the chat, but the chat will remain open. And so with that, please do keep in mind as well that the chat is being monitored and there is no tolerance for any unruly language. So please use the Q&A box rather than the chat to submit questions and keep it a safe place for everyone. Um, so I just want to pull up our ground rules for everyone. To review, so right now during this session, we all have the responsibility to respect and build on the strength that diversity provides. We will engage in polite, constructive, productive dialogue and feedback. We will respectfully disagree with each other. Unless you are a designated representative of an organization, opinions are considered your own. When sharing a question, please be short and to the point. And we wanna use this moment and space to take some time to allow for self-reflection and as always, continue to take deep breaths because a lot of these topics that we do discuss during the community conversations can be really difficult. And so with that, I would like to um, introduce Jennifer Raitt, who is Arlington's Director of Planning and Community Development. Jenny was instrumental in planning this event and she has 25 years of experience serving local and state government and nonprofit organizations focused on housing, community development, and community planning. And Jenny is a member of the Transit Matters Board, Brookline Housing Advisory Board, Metropolitan Area Municipal, um, Metropolitan Area Planning Council Executive Committee, the Massachusetts Municipal Association, Chapa Policy Leadership Council and Fair Housing Committee, the American Planning Association, and APA Massachusetts Chapter Legislative and Policy Officer. And Jenny is also serving as a Brookline Town Meeting Member. So I'd like to welcome Jenny to the screen, to the screen, I guess, <laughs> um, to continue with our introductions and opening for the night. Thank you so much, Jill. Really appreciate being here this evening with everybody. I'm Jenny Raitt. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the town. It's my pleasure to provide a kickoff to this conversation tonight. I'm going to start by um, walking us through the past. Um, just a, a very brief um, introduction to things that happened in the past related to fair housing in Arlington, uh, specifically related to organizing efforts that happened by the town of Arlington in the 1990s to establish a fair housing advisory committee which bloomed and blossomed into something very special for the town, including a, an organization that focused on affordable housing um, in partnership with the Housing Corporation for Arlington, which now is our local community development corporation that serves the town of Arlington and its communities. Um, the Fair Housing Advisory Committee was focused primarily on promoting and implementing fair housing in Arlington by providing info, uh, all kinds of information and services uh, about regarding um, housing discrimination and other housing related issues to both current and prospective residents, as well as realtors and landlords, recognizing that there was a public issue related to fair housing, as well as the private sector's issues related to fair housing. Um, the group was instrumental in developing a fair and affirmative marketing plan that related to affordable housing units that were being developed at that time. They also then oversaw and were instrumental in being included in developing the inclusionary zoning bylaw once it was the year 2001, as well as coordination of other affordable housing efforts um, and the hiring of a staff person who worked in the Department of Planning and Community Development focused on housing. So Arlington's um, 
efforts related to fair housing really go back quite some time. And it has been a, a consistent topic really throughout um, many decades. Um, even prior to the 1990s, prior to the Fair Housing Advisory Committee being organized, there were many social efforts that were the town was engaged in or leading or partnering with various community-based organizations on. Arlington evolved uh, to have the Vision 2020 Committee, which then is now, is now considered the Envision Arlington uh, Committee. We also developed and uh, eventually adopted the Arlington Master Plan, a housing production plan, and many other things occurred to recognize that in order to be a more inclusive community, we must take clear actions and continue to remove various barriers um, and through various method, methods uh, to remove those, those barriers so that people can access our community and feel that they're included um, and involved. Creating an equitable community planning is really at the root of that. I see planning and community de development as being key to that mission to achieve a more equitable community. Planning is significant in this regard because we also have a historic legacy of land use planning and zoning that has been a barrier to allowing people to come into various communities. Federal programs up through today have been also a component of that process of not allowing people into communities. Um, and so much more work needs to be done. Of course, we recognize that. This was one of the reasons why we decided to engage in the development of a Fair Housing Action Plan, which you're gonna hear a little bit about tonight um, from various panelists, as well as our current housing plan development effort, which we've been developing for the last few months and will continue to throughout the course of this year, which will allow us to create some new strategies. There's an intersection between affordable housing and fair housing. As I mentioned, that was the case in the 90s when these things were first being talked about in the community at a committee level, and they continue today. And you'll hear about that intersection tonight. We have so much more work to do and we're excited to start this conversation with all of you this evening. And for now, I'm going to turn it over to Judy and we'll be back a little bit later to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Jillian, are you bringing up my slides? Great. Thank you. So as Jenny said, I'm Judy Barrett, and I am going to be helping to moderate the panel this evening. I want to talk to you a little bit about the housing plan work that's currently underway and how that relates to the topic that we're going to be discussing this evening. Um, and at the conclusion of my few slides here, I will give you a brief introduction to our three panelists and then turn it over to the first speaker. So um, this is about kind of how fair housing and affordable housing come together uh, to raise a lot of kind of uh, mutually interesting and important questions. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So Arlington has a fair housing plan. I, I confess that I prepared these slides yesterday. And as I understand it, the fair housing plan actually is in now. But yesterday, it was still to be delivered soon. Um, so that effort was underway over the past year and is going to benefit the housing plan uh, that I and my colleagues are working on because a big part of the inquiry about affordable housing really has to do with, with how price can regulate um, the demographics of a community. Um, and so, you know, so you have the fair housing plan, you will have the housing plan. You're also a member of a group called the North Suburban Home Consortium uh, which participates uh, you know, in a planning process every five years as well as each year on how federal home funds will be used. Um, and so that's another type of housing plan the town has. And of course, there are others. I happen to have the privilege of working on the master plan. So I'm familiar with that. And so people might wonder like, why do we have so many plans? Next slide, please. Because housing affordability, uh, which is really the focus of, of our effort, um, affects the choices that people can make about where they will live and about where, whether they'll rent or own a home, what the choices will be in that regard, the kinds of housing they will be able to choose from, uh, the schools that their children will attend uh, if, they are, if they have children, and then what people can afford to pay for food and for health care and for other basic needs. Um, when housing prices are really very stressful on household budgets, 
other things give way. And sometimes it's those other basic needs um, that have to go so that people can hang on to the shelter that they have. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background, and I know that our panelists tonight will have a lot more to say about this, so I'm not going to go into great history. Um, Jenny, of course, covered the situation in Arlington back to the 1990s, and I, I just want to point out that actually it was 1968, it was a week after Martin Luther King was assassinated, um, that the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed by Congress. And, and that act prohibits discrimination based on race and color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. So those are the umbrella categories that are protected under federal law. But because we have um, state laws that also address um, fair housing, there are additional considerations that a fair housing plan would have, and that certainly the affordable housing plan will also be taking into account. Next slide, please. In Massachusetts, we have certain constitutional protections um, that, that uh, guarantee equality um, based on uh, sex, race, color, creed, and national origin. So there's a lot of uh, kind of relationship between the state constitutional protections and our federal law, which of course is anchored in the civil rights protections of our US Constitution. Next slide, please. Um, under state law, there are certain things that are just categorically prohibited. Um, one is, of course, housing discrimination, simply not allowed. The umbrella statute is Chapter 151B. Uh, discrimination in public accommodation is also not allowed. And then certainly discrimination based on disability through zoning is not allowed. So there are certain provisions in the Zoning Act in Massachusetts that bar communities from discrimination based on the needs of people with disabilities. Next slide, please. Chapter 151B, the Massachusetts Anti-Discrimination Law, protects many, many groups. Uh, in addition to those um, that are protected by federal law, we have, the, we have the other populations that are listed on this slide, um, gender identity, sexual orientation, genetic information, ancestry, marital status, uh, veteran status, uh, familial status, source of income. These are all in addition to the federal act. So again, when we're looking at uh, issues around community demographics and who, who is able to live or not able to live in a community, we look at all of these groups and their relative presence uh, in the community and factors that might contribute to perhaps why they may be um, underrepresented relative to towns around them or throughout the rather uh, the, the larger metro area. Next slide, please. So much of our work in, on the housing plan is going to be around a needs analysis. It's the heart of any housing plan. And so we will look at things such as housing cost burden, which is this concept that has to do with how much of your income on a monthly basis are you having to pay for housing. And our affected classes, such as those listed in the previous slides, are they more affected than perhaps uh, others? Um, looking at perhaps concentrations, uh, if they exist, well, these are sort of standards that anybody looks at in a housing needs assessment is, you know, are there concentrations of poverty? Are there, uh, you know, are there patterns of integration or segregation in the community on the basis of race and other factors? Um, based on where affordable housing exists, uh, is there equal access throughout the community to various community assets, schools, uh, stores? churches, et cetera, you know, community kind of service uh, institutions. Is there a disproportionate housing need based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, or handicap? Um, and so that is this concept of perhaps some groups are, are more affected than others. And we look to the data and to interviews and other things that we learn about the community to understand whether that disproportionate housing need exists. Uh, and then we also look at what the community's fair housing enforcement and outreach capacity is. Of course, naturally, since the town has a freshly completed fair housing plan, we'll rely on that document a lot to understand the last point on this slide. When a community doesn't have that, we kind of have to ask, uh, you know, our, on our own, but we have a wonderful source now for that. But, but nonetheless, we look at these considerations. Next slide, please. 
we will ask ourselves and our, our interviewees in the town and others, you know, does the shortage of affordable housing affect some households more than others? And a little bit of an insight into perhaps some statistics in Arlington, Arlington that are interesting. Black or African American households have the lowest median household income in your community and frankly in almost all of the surrounding communities. The median income of homeowners in Arlington is 1.9 times higher than that of your renters. White non-Hispanic homeowners outnumber minority homeowners eight to one. And the age of renter occupied housing in Arlington's area is generally quite old. About 68% of your rental renter occupied stock was built prior to 1980. So to a housing planner that matters to us because that suggests there may be a higher likelihood of some housing quality problems, notably lead paint. Next slide, please. Almost half of your housing units have three or more bedrooms, but for renters, it's just 16%. Renters with household incomes below $50,000 comprise about 26% of all renters. About 82% of those lower income renters pay over 30% of their monthly income on housing costs. So that's that concept of housing cost burden that I mentioned earlier. Housing affordability for people with disabilities would be especially challenging in your community. The average household income of householders with disabilities is $12,462 a year. They can afford $311.35 per month for rent. So, you know, it gives you kind of a picture. If you think back to the slide where I showed those, those groups that are most protected under these uh, anti-discrimination laws, how these various uh, preliminary findings about Arlington would suggest it does look like some households are more affected than others uh, about the, the shortage of affordable housing. Next slide, please. This is just a, big, a picture of, of regional data. I realize it might be difficult to see on your screen, but it's basically a comparison of what Black and, uh, and Latinx renters uh, experience in the region uh, not just Arlington, but the sort of greater Boston area relative to, um, to other populations. So for example, um, uh, black, uh, black householders who rent uh, are likely to have at least 27% um, will be paying more than 50% of their income on housing costs. That is considered severe housing cost burden. That compares with, um, you know, 23% of the of all households who rent and 21% of white. When you get into ownership, you can see a kind of a similar pattern that black and, um, and Latinx households simply have a much greater incidence of housing cost burden at the severe level, half their income going to housing uh, as other groups. So it kind of underscores that the condition in Arlington is not unique, it's part of a regional problem. But of course, that means that people from outside the community are also having would have also have difficulty choosing to live in Arlington and choosing to join your community and be your neighbors. Next slide, please. So we have three panelists tonight, um, all really esteemed people. I'm not going to read their entire um, biographies. Those are, of course, on the invitation to the um, to the event this evening. Um, but I'll kind of go in the order that they're going to speak and just briefly summarize them. And then I'm going to turn this over to Bob, who will be the first panelist speaking. So Bob is a part-time lecturer at Tufts University's um, graduate program of urban and environmental policy and planning. Uh, he's active in a number of fair housing initiatives in the Boston area, such as the Roxbury Neighborhood Council, Madison um, Park Development Corporation, Board of Directors, Citizens Housing Planning, um, excuse me, Citizen Housing and Planning Association's Policy Leadership Council and many others. Um, and so we're very fortunate to have him join us this evening. Our second speaker after Bob will be Whitney Demetrius, who is the Director of Housing Engagement at Citizens Housing and Planning Association. She works with their Municipal in Initiative Program, Initiative Engagement Initiative, pardon me. Her, her mission in life is to change the local conversation about housing by empowering people who are most affected by the lack of affordable housing, uh, elevating housing choices for, uh, you know, for, uh, above the opposition often. Um, 
and then setting a stage for diverse and equitable local conditions. So she will be speaking after Bob. And then our final panelist um, is Diane Glover from the director from the um, Fair Housing and Community Development Project. She is the director. Um, and so Diane is, uh, she has over 35 years of experience in public, private, and nonprofit sectors. So Diane and I have been in the business about the same amount of time. Um, she provides legal assistance to nonprofit organizations and jurisdictions on fair housing, housing advocacy, housing development, and so on. So um, we're very lucky to have all three of them. But I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob as our first speaker. And I will be timing everybody very carefully. I'll just warn all the panelists now, you each have about 10 minutes to speak. So I'm going to sign off now and Jillian will bring Bob up. Great, Bob, there you are. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. And to uh, the organizers of, of this event, thank you very, very much for your kind invitation. Uh, it's really a privilege and an honor to uh, be a part of uh, this panel. And I will try to uh, use my my 10 minutes that I have very judiciously. I'm gonna break my comments into two major parts. The rest we can, we can get to in the Q&A section, I'm sure. First is the historical background behind what we call affirmatively furthering fair housing. I had a chance to take a look at Arlington's new fair housing action plan, which was hot off the press, I guess it was today, and I had a chance to review parts of it. It is an excellent document. I would uh, commend that to everybody's reading, but one of the, the key points I want to make in my presentation is that this fair housing plan just didn't come out of nowhere. There is a long legislative and regulatory history behind affirmatively furthering fair housing. It is not just a concept we like to throw out there. It is a provision within our Fair Housing Act. Section 3608 of the Fair Housing Act stipulates that the Secretary of HUD has an obligation to affirmatively further fair housing. And that that obligation is extended to all HUD grantees by way of a, a number of statutes, particularly the 1974 Housing and Community Development Act. And this is very important because when a municipality, a city, a town, or a public housing authority receives funding from HUD, they take on this obligation to affirmatively further fair housing, which means to be proactive in your enforcement and your compliance around the Fair Housing Act. Uh, recently, um, HUD has reinstated uh, the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Regulation. Uh, for about a decade, there was a lot of advocacy, a lot of pressure put on HUD to really make use of this particular me mechanism to improve fair housing enforcement throughout the country. Uh, a number of national organizations lobbied HUD the General Accounting Office at the federal government said to HUD, you're really not doing much with your analyses of impediments to fair housing choice. You need to do more with that. And so finally, during the Obama administration, particularly after a big lawsuit in Westchester County, uh, the Obama administration started taking affirmatively furthering seriously and in July of 2015, came out with a new regulation. Those of us who are close to this issue realize that yes, there was an attempt by the previous administration, whose name will go unmentioned, to undermine affirmatively furthering fair housing. But since the Biden administration has come into office, they have reinstated that regulation. As a matter of fact, today is the deadline for comments on their draft regulation. And by the 31st of July, we will have a new final rule. And the reason that HUD worked very hard to get that final rule in place 
is because a number of municipalities and housing authorities this summer were getting ready to send in their action plans to HUD. And HUD wanted to make sure that as they filled out those documents and those action plans, uh, that they were doing so with a regulation that was properly constructed legally and that was uh, consistent with the Fair Housing Act. Now, there's a couple of aspects about affirmatively furthering fair housing that are important for us as planners and people concerned about affordable housing and housing production to keep in mind. Affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, is a tool to fight discrimination, to dismantle segregated housing markets, and to create inclusive communities. So first and foremost, it is a planning tool. Secondly, it is a contractual agreement that HUD and its grantees enter into in exchange for securing funding. Arlington receives CDBG funds, home funds, um, and probably other funding sources from HUD. When you sign your documents and your contracts to receive that money, one of the things that those contracts stipulate is that you will uphold the Fair Housing Act and that you will affirmatively further fair housing. So I, I can't emphasize enough that cities and towns and public housing authorities have a contractual agreement with HUD to do this. It is a powerful planning tool because it, if it is done properly, it impacts every phase, every phase of housing production, zoning, master planning. And Arlington has engaged in all of those activities. And the Fair Housing Act makes it very, very clear that any and all activities in the public sector through federal funding, but in the private sector, generally across the board with, without even funding even be involved, that the Fair Housing Act applies to all of those activities. So whether you're pursuing a very aggressive and expansive housing production plan or a very moderate one, or one that is very slow in its pace in terms of growth and development, whichever strategy you as a town pursue the Fair Housing Act is applicable to any and all of those situations. It's also a very important intersectional document. Um, housing is central to a person's life, to a family, to a household. It is central to everything we do. And not only did they put out a new affirmatively furthering fair housing regulation. But along with it, they also put forth an assessment tool as a guide to cities and towns on how to write an assessment of fair housing. And that assessment tool was very intersectional. How does housing impact public health, education, transportation? And likewise, how do all those factors impact your housing? So all of these issues in our urban planning have to be brought together in order to make these plans highly, highly effective. So I would highly recommend that people not only read the fair housing plan that's hot off the press in Arlington, but also take a look at the assessment tool and the regulation that HUD has just put forward. Affirmatively furthering fair housing is also a reminder to focus on our protected classes. The litmus test for any of these activities and the key question we should ask is, how do any of our policies, practices, programs, how do they affect our protected classes? You just heard a review, a demographic review of the, the situation in Arlington with regard to our protected classes. So in any housing strategy that is pursued, that question has to be asked. 
the question that we asked for this panel discussion was who gets to decide who gets to live where? Well, the answer to that question is people have a right to live anywhere they want to live. That's what the Fair Housing Act was passed to ensure that people have equality of access to housing wherever they choose to live. And uh, if their rights are violated in any way, that they have legal recourse to protect their civil rights. And that leads me to the, the last characteristic of affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is it's a mechanism for fair housing enforcement and compliance. Uh, in my opinion, we need to expand our fair housing infrastructure. And many of us are taking steps to see that that's going to happen in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and uh, it's very important that we get the support of our state government uh, in support of expanding fair housing infrastructure. Unless we have very vigorous enforcement, fair housing begins to fall by the wayside. The last thing I'll say, I know that in Arlington, there has been a great debate about land use and zoning. Uh, one of the experiences we had recently in Boston, we just completed our assessment of fair housing um, in January of this year after about five years of negotiations with our city government. But one of the great victories that came out of it was legislation put forward by Lydia Edwards, uh, who was the city councilor representing the North End in East Boston. And her amendment to our zoning code was truly historic. It was the first time that a municipality anywhere in the United States put fair housing language principles and values into its zoning code. And that's gonna be very significant for the city of Boston. Uh, it means now that every zoning decision that's made, whether we're amending the zoning code whether we're granting conditional use permits or variances or reviewing projects for compliance must be seen through the lens of fair housing. How do those decisions affect the protected classes in our city? So I think I will stop there. I have much more in my notes that I wanted to cover, but I think it would be best if we pick those up during the Q&A session. Thank you. And I believe the next speaker is my great colleague, uh, fair housing colleague, Whitney Demetrius. Whitney, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, I'm so glad to be following you and your remarks, uh, especially because I, I always learn something uh, when I, I hear you speak. So thank you so much, Bob. Happy to be following you because then there's not much left for me to cover. I can kind of skim through some of my slides here. So again, I want to uh, thank the organizers for uh, allowing me to be in the space with you all today. I'm excited to talk with you all in this Arlington community conversation. So the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about who is CHAPA and what do we do? And Please let me know if you're having issues at all um, seeing me. Let me know in the chat, um, but I'm not sure if it's working on my end, but I'll continue. Our mission at CHAPA, a Citizens Housing and Planning Association, is really to uh, encourage the production and preservation of housing that is affordable to low and moderate income families and individuals uh, to foster diverse and sustainable communities uh, through planning and community development. Right, so we advocate for opportunity, uh, the idea of expanding access to housing, and then certainly to develop the field. Uh, on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about um, what all this has to do um, with each other in correlation to the work, right? So equity, access, and inclusion. Um, housing choice. Can you afford to live here, right? So not only can you afford to live here monetarily, these are the questions that we're sort of asking as we approach this work, but also how can you afford 
to live in a community in every other aspect of the word, right? Can you afford to live there? What are you giving up? What do you come across? What are the obstacles um, in that sense, right? And so equity, access, and inclusion, as my uh, colleagues here on the panel have also talked about, really overlap with health, education, jobs, healthy foods, um, as well as with housing, right? So these inequities that we see are really a result of deliberate and intentional realities, right? And so we see that in zoning and restrictive covenants and segregation and Jim Crow laws, redlining, exclusionary zoning, overt discrimination, right? All of these things. But really reversing those impacts that we see must also be as intentional and as deliberate, right? So re-examining local preference, affirmative marketing plans, housing as reparations, eviction moratoriums, inclusionary zoning, local fair housing committees and fair housing plans like we alluded to, how you all are doing here in Arlington, analysis of impediments, diversifying your housing stock, right? To bring in more diversity in homes and in people. Um, and creating certainly welcoming uh, communities. And so uh, I'll continue with on the next slide to really talk a little bit more about, you know, um, this in terms of housing matters, right? Housing matters back in 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was, um, was issued and Fair Housing matters now, housing matters now. We've seen that in the last year as well with this pandemic or the, uh, certainly we've seen these correlations and we've been in these conversations, but housing matters then and it matters now. Uh, the next slide, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, I won't get into the specifics of the protected classes, right? Uh, where my colleagues have talked about that previously. But I think what's important to note here in terms of protected classes is a few things. One, that everyone is a member of a protected class. Right? So why do we care about this work? Why do we care about fair housing? How do we get folks to lean in in terms of the interest of this work is really to recognize that everyone is a member of a protected class. Um, and so again, in terms of that, these protections, uh, I wanted to make sure that I know that I often do in these trainings is that it's an actual and perceived Right, so um, whether it is actually your religion or not, like the actual perceived, um, if you have discriminate, been discriminated against on these various protected statuses, you're covered. So I wanted to make sure that we raise that as well in the space. So some of what I've been charged to do in our conversation here together is to talk a little bit about what Chapa has sort of. Um, taken on in its work, in our policy work, right? Um, and so on the next slide, we wanna make sure that we kind of talk about how we envision this in terms of uh, what's, what happens federally, right? So the former administration really had a rescinding of the uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing rule. And this idea of uh, really wanting to bring things back to how things are and, um, to you know, enjoy your life as it is in the suburbs, right? And so we're happy to see in the next slide, we won't spend too much time on this slide, but in the next slide, we're happy to see that in the, under the Biden administration, um, there has been a revisioning, right? A redressing of building back better and fair housing. Certainly back in January of this year, the administration issued a memo of redressing the nation's federal um, and the uh, federal government's history of discriminatory housing practices and policies, right? And doing a real working and examining what needs to be done to undo um, some of what happened in the former administration. Uh, the next slide, you'll see I sort of outlined some of what that memo included in terms of reviewing the administration's efforts uh, to undercut affirmatively furthering uh, fair housing and disparate impact liability. Uh, to examine the effects of the 2020 rule um, of disparate impact, to examine the effects of the amending of the discriminatory effects standards, uh, the HUD secretary to also examine the effects of uh, preserving community and neighborhood choice rule as well. So um, as uh, Bob, our, my colleague has mentioned, in addition to that, 
Um, more recently, they have reissued the Affirmatively Furthering for a Housing Rule in its interim form, and we'll be seeing that in its final form uh, soon, as he mentioned, the deadline being um, today for the comments there. So excited to see that happening and being reinstated. However, despite who might be in our uh, federal administration, one of the things that CHAPA has been really thinking through thoroughly is how do we have something on the state level, right, that sort of gets at these issues despite uh, what's happening federally, right? Despite if the rule federally is um, rescinded or not, what are the obligations that we have on the state level? Certainly much of this is motivated by, as Bob mentioned, uh, the great uh, counselor at Lydia Edwards and the Community Advisory Committee uh, in Boston who has linked affirmatively furthering with, with zoning. We see uh, the, the city of Boston, we see Arlington, right, putting together their own fair housing plans. But what does it mean for other cities and towns uh, for them to do something affirmatively um, as well. So on the next slide, uh, we'll outline some of our CHAPA fair housing legislative agendas. Uh, so we have sort of these three bills, one on exclusionary zoning, the second, again, affirmatively furthering fair housing, and then lastly, a fair housing disparate impact standard. Um, and so the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about each one of those. And our exclusionary zoning uh, rule, it is to uh, act promoting fair housing by preventing discrimination against affordable housing, right? So um, you don't wanna build this particular um, development because it will overcrowd the schools. Like what does that mean in terms of um, familial status discrimination, right? Um, and so certainly Massachusetts has high levels of residential segregation, restrictive local zoning um, and permitting um, and the like. Um, but this is something to get ahead of that. And I know my time is winding, so I'll, I'll fly through the remainder of these slides and I believe these slides may be available to you guys afterwards. On the next slide here, I'll talk a bit about affirmatively furthering, right? This will allow for a statewide duty to affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, we've also, as I mentioned, we looked to the work that city uh, councilor Edwards did. We looked at what uh, the state of California has done in creating an affirmatively furthering fair housing sta standard statewide, but really to address these sort of um, these similar issues. Uh, the next slide, uh, we are looking at the disparate impact standard to establish a fair housing um, disparate impact standard which despite what the intent is, if there is an impact on protected status um, individuals, you can bring a claim forward. So um, certainly wanted to make sure we included that as well. I'll fly through, I'll try, I think my time is winding down the next few, uh, few slides, but really this idea that your zip code should not determine your future, right? And there are many things to consider in much of this, but we understand that it's historical biases are really baked into the communities that we love. And it's great that Arlington has a plan, it has an action plan, um, because if you have no plan then you plan to fail, you, you plan to repeat uh, history. And so I really want to applaud uh, the work that's, being, that's happening here in Arlington and really this idea that where you choose to live, you can go to the next slide, but where you choose to live uh, is one thing, right? Bob talked about like fair housing, this idea of fair housing is that you're able to choose where you wanna live, but it's, you're able to live there if you can afford to live there. And so how do you get, pa how do you get past that issue in terms of access? Um, you must think about affordability and how do you expand this idea of different types of housing diversity so you can create open communities. So your community can actually be, be open. You can say, oh, you can live here, but you just have to be able to make, you know, six figures in order to do so. And so there's a barrier there. So larger context of racial equity and fair housing, as far as transportation, schools, um, gateways to wealth, um, access to healthy food, all of this that which we talked about. Um, and then I think lastly, I uh, just have a, a few more slides, but I'll just talk, Just these are just talking about sort of what you can do and how you all can get involved past what you all are able to do here in Arlington. And so I'll, I'll end there, 
uh, and allow for uh, my colleagues to continue. Um, I'm happy to be able to turn it over to Diane. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, fair housing in Arlington. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. Um, I'm actually unhappy to go after both of you because you guys were so good and covered so much um, great things. I'm Diane Glauber from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which is a national civil rights organization located in Washington, DC. And you might wonder what I'm doing in Arlington. Um, in fact, we work across the country, um, including several jurisdictions in, Mass with, in Massachusetts. And having read and produced a number of fair housing plans, I think we've written about 25 of them. I have to say that this is one of the best for the reason that there is such an ownership of past issues and such a desire to correct the past and to, as was discussed, affirmatively further fair housing. I'm gonna to touch on some highlights of the plan. I hope you read it. It takes a while, but in lieu of that, I will breeze through the, these slides to discuss what um, some of the key aspects of the plan and then look forward to questions. I just wanted to point out a few um, um, data points that surprised me. So only 5% of Arlington households receive public assistance for housing, which is also co often called a housing choice voucher, which is quite low in comparison. Um, and you, Arlington is very much predominantly white, as you probably know. Um, and to that end, there is a, a real barrier for people um, that are in these protected classes from moving to Arlington and in some cases staying in Arlington. Um, there's some, we, we looked at some of the fair housing complaints and a lot are disability and ch um, children related complaints. I would say around the country, the number one complaint is service animals, which has been a very topical conversation in the news. Um, to, to no one's surprise, um, housing is predominantly single family and any multifamily housing um, has to go through a number of hoops and it's currently only permitted on 9% of the land, which is really surprising. And as Massachusetts in January passed a number of very progressive housing related laws and Arlington will need to comply with them. So we can discuss that in a minute. If we could go to the next slide. And the next one. So the plan is um, broken up into sections. And this one is about sort of the education enforcement of fair housing laws. Um, it's a shame that the there's a, their fair housing organization in Boston closed its doors recently. So there aren't, there isn't a FIP, which, which is a HUD program that, um, that provides testing and enforcement in this area. Although the state does um, have, um, have a program as the human, and, also, I would say that um, the law school, Suffolk Law School has a program. So because that, there's probably a need to do far more outreach and education on fair housing laws. So first of all, Arlington is passing a resolution that makes that commitment, which is great. Um, and we are you know, undertaking public discussions on housing like we are doing right now. Um, the, the town leadership boards, commissions and nonprofits and real estate professionals also need some education and training. A lot of discrimination is a result of real estate professionals and they are not always in sync with the law. So that those are really important um, education opportunities, okay. So this one, is really more wide sweeping than I, you know, lets on because 
in the plan, again, I'm highlighting, but in the, in the plan, there's a whole section, on how can we change our government structures to address fair housing concerns, which is very progressive and very unusual, I might add. So um, one of them is to add this housing working group to the Arlington Human Rights Commission to focus on housing, which is there currently is not that focus. And then changing the complaint to driven code enforcement system to one with regular um, proactive inspections. And the reason this one is so important is because there is such a fear of retribution. And if you have a complaint driven code enforcement process, you have to call somebody to come out. The landlord may know it's you, especially if it's a smaller um, multifamily unit, and they may, may want to kick you out as a result in, or other retribution. So that's why this is so important. And then um, institute an equity impact assessment for each item um, that the town on, on housing and community development. So that means this equity analysis will go far beyond here's the plan and we're going to call it a day for another three to five years. So this means that is sort of bringing that fair housing lens into all the um, activities as it relates to um, funding and programs and new developments. So it probably is not a surprise that zoning and fair housing are inextricably linked. We as a civil rights organization have filed a number of um, zoning complaints because of exclusionary zoning, which as um, I think it was previously mentioned, prevents affordable housing by requiring minimum lot sizes. Let's say an acre per lot is an example of a more egregious um, zoning issue, but there are a number of um, zoning um, laws on the books that basically provide an impediment to developing housing by developers. So one great, great idea is to allow the duplex development as of right. So the reason as of right is so important is that as of right means you don't have to go through a process of approvals that can be somewhat arbitrary, sometimes capricious, and could lead to decisions that may not be in keeping with the um, the actual situations. For example, environmental reviews that are very like unnecessary if you if you have an existing unit, for example, or um, other ways to get a lot of. I'm sure you've heard the term NIMBY, but NIMBY opposition. So as of right is a really important concept in zoning. And to that end, to allow duplexes where there have been historically duplexes and three family um, townhouse and multifamily housing in districts um, meant for them. And consider as of right developments that are 100% affordable housing. This Massachusetts goes a long way with its 40B program to allow sort of some zoning challenges to allow for multifamily housing, but um, the facts the city is the town is looking at it on a more local basis is great. Okay, um, you know the reason prices are so expensive is that there aren't that many units available. The need far exceeds the demand, and therefore there is a mismatch. So more housing would bring in more affordable housing. So. Um, there is an inclusionary zoning requirement, and um, it would be this, the town is looking at ways to make it more robust and to be used more frequently. Um, there also is a local preference policy, but again, that doesn't affirmatively further fair housing when you're trying to get people that normally couldn't com come to Arlington because of the barriers we talked about to actually um, be able to live there. Um, there's clearly a regional housing supply. It's not just Arlington. And um, that's why it's important to have that collaboration across jurisdictions, but it's important for Arlington to do its fair share. And then prioritize family size units. There seems to be a lot of single family, maybe um, one bedroom apartments. It's, it's great for people with disabilities and seniors, but there are 
I think only one affordable, there's one affordable housing project for families that have adequate, um, you know, size like two bedrooms plus, and there is always a need for more of um, affordable family size units. Okay, um, so there, here are some examples where the town could use its own resources by looking at its tax exemption system and maybe applying to income eligible members of protected classes, um, look at alternative funding resources such as housing bonds that have been used quite a bit in California and elsewhere and offer grants or low interest loans to for more accessible units in historic housing because you do have an older housing stock. Okay, so without getting in the weeds, um, there is a way for Arlington to look at having higher payments for voucher holders, um, allowing landlords to have higher rent um, and housing um, voucher recipients paying a third of their income of um, rent so it wouldn't impact them by having more small area um, fair market rents. Instead of looking at the entire region, the entire Boston region, you could look at a much more targeted targeted census tracts where the rents are higher than some of the areas in Boston, for example. Um, look at eliminating rental application fees for voucher holders. I've heard many stories, not in Arlington, but others who have been in, voucher holders enticed to apply for units where they have no interest in renting to them and paying all these fees. Massachusetts does have a source of income income discrimination law that requires landlords to accept housing choice vouchers, but we know firsthand that that is not always the case. And um, landlords often screen out for everything. We've seen landlords screen out for arrests where there's been no convictions um, and very minor misdemeanors that occurred five, 10, 20 years ago. So there is guidance that HUD has on criminal background screening that we, that um, landlords should follow. Okay, so displacement is an issue in Arlington and, and virtually everywhere else, except where I'm sitting in Baltimore, Maryland, we don't have that much of that, but um, there are tenant protections. Of course, you know, COVID has really impacted tenants and there are protections in place that will be ending. Um, so we expect a, a huge wave of evictions coming up fairly soon. Um, we'd like to make sure that landlords have um, give significant notice when they are selling or redeveloping the property so tenants could find suitable housing. Um, there's also a statewide push for this Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act. So the town has indicated an interest in supporting purchases purchasers through this, um, if this act does pass. And then there are, people with disabilities often have a hard time finding accessible housing, particularly in the older buildings. Um, there's also not a lot of outreach um, to these um, tenants who also have other, you know, have a variety of issues in finding housing. And so it's important to make sure that tenants know available accessible units, as well as making modifications to make sure that units are, there are available accessible units. Um, and then partner with some financial or quasi public institutions to make financing options available to protected classes. It's absolutely no secret that protected classes have a far lower rate of uh, mortgage approvals. And um, there often needs to be some intervention with local financial institutions to make sure that they're meeting their um, CRA requirements and other requirements. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd just like to invite all the panelists back on. Um, and Judy is going to lead the discussion and then followed by some Q&A. 
That was great. Um, thank you, everyone. There are a few questions in Q&A. We've also been kind of thinking about some questions as you've been talking. So let me kind of go to the Q&A questions first and bring those up. And then we do have some others for you um, as well. Um, one of the questions, pretty direct, is if, if it is a legal, if it's a legal obligation to promote fair housing actively, why does community activism against this work so effectively? Um, why are municipalities listening to people who ask them then to break the law? Shall I pick on someone or do you want to sort of jump in um, on your own? Robert, do you want to, Bob, do you want to talk or do you want me to? Sure. Um, <laughs> I, I guess the, the short answer is, unfortunately, in the United States, we have something called de jure segregation, uh, where the political structures and the legal structures of the country uh, for decades and centuries supported Jim Crow segregation in one form or another. So um, and as a matter of fact, the first civil rights law that was ever passed in the United States was passed in 1866. So they've been breaking federal laws uh, for quite some time. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's deeply embedded in the, in the political culture. And it took the pressure of the civil rights movement in the 60s and 70s to begin a counter movement uh, to not only Im improve the civil rights laws, but to try to get them enforced. But don't forget, every time we come up with a legal or political or regulatory mechanism to guarantee people their rights, the other side is working just as hard to unravel them and undercut them, as we currently see. We, we have a, a group of legislators who had to fly from Texas to DC the other day to prevent the legislature from passing a law that's a Jim Crow law that would have taken people's voting rights away. So it's, it's understandable that there's been this political tug of war uh, throughout our history. And, uh, but there are folks in this country who think we're gonna go backwards, but we're not. We're gonna go forward uh, we're on the right side of history, and eventually we're going to prevail. Diane, did you want to follow up? Um, no, I think okay. Bob is absolutely right. Um, and as I mentioned in my presentation, Arlington is pretty progressive, and I've been, you know, I I think that it's one of the best plans because of that sort of accepting responsibility aspect of it. And I can't tell you how many jurisdictions I've worked with that don't want to do this. They had to do it, so they are forced to do it. They water down every recommendation that looks like, you know, to consider or think about or perhaps or whatever. And this plan doesn't do any of that. So I think the accountability is really high here. And Judy, if I may, I, yeah. I'd love to jump in just in some respect as well, because I'm reminded of my, my time sort of providing some technical assistance in Arlington and to hear sort of comments oftentimes that were sometimes discriminatory, right? It had this sort of language there. And I, I, I'm sorry, Jenny, I have to pick on you, but I, I must say, I was so, so enlightened and impressed to hear her response to that comment, right? In terms of being able to uh, discern and identify, right? A statement such as like, we're not going to take a um, discriminatory for housing <laughs> comments into consideration and making these decisions. Like, you know, the board is mindful that they're not going to take those into consideration. How do you have this language of aforehand? How do you train, give training and provide the resources available to various boards and to municipalities and decision makers, right? In this planning aspect aspect so that they are clear um, on how they might respond, right? Because it's like this free speech and people can say what they want to say, but also this is for housing component that really sort of 
provides this guidance about around public discourse. And so that's one of the things that we at CHAPA are sort of really working alongside some of our other technical assistance providers to really think about um, providing some more guidance, right? Um, and again, it goes back to, as Bob said, this is historical, this has been happening for some time, but oft oftentimes the language is sort of guised as something else. It's not as overt saying we don't want X living here, right, in our community, but it's guised as something else. And so as we look at sort of the work that we're, policy work we're looking at in terms of pushing new legislation around exclusionary zoning and disparate impact, right, and all of these different things, we're considering all of that um, in some of the barriers that, again, does actually trickle down sometimes in the decision making, but how do we provide uh, the resources and, and the language much like I saw Jenny jump in and, and stay um, in one of these sort of community meetings um, to provide across the state. So those are some of the things we're thinking about as well. Thank you, Bob, did you wanna add something? Yeah, um, um, not to be too philosophical about it, but I've been, spending the last two or three days reading a lot of documents about Arlington. And <laughs> I found some really fascinating stuff. Um, and one of the things is Arlington is a really hot real estate market. People are clamoring to buy housing in Arlington. I found that in the last couple of years, uh, the number of transactions in the private side of the market has doubled. Uh, it doubled last year, and already in the first six months of this year, it's up to 108 transactions, which means it's going to probably break the record from last year. So, and I also found out that when housing is put on the market, it stays on for about eight days. Stuff moves very, very quickly at a very, very high price. So for those who take the view that they don't want either more housing or more people or new people, newsflash, uh, new people are moving into Arlington already. Right. It's a popular place, it's gonna, it's gonna remain popular and folks are, are gonna buy in. Um, I'm, oftentimes when I hear about opposition to affordable housing, multifamily housing, expanding housing, I don't think it's the housing that people are opposed to. I think it's the people that the housing is likely to attract. Back to our issues of protected classes. Well, newsflash, folks, we live in a metropolitan area that's becoming more diverse every day. People are piling in to the Boston metropolitan area for all sorts of reasons. And some of them are gonna stay in the Boston area and they're gonna look for housing and they're not just gonna live in Boston. They're going to look to other parts of the metropolitan area. So, and that group is becoming, even with gentrification and displacement, which we're fighting tooth and nail in Boston, that new population is becoming more diverse. And the places that attract that new labor force, that, that are going to be working in the creative economy, in the innovative economy, in the biotech world, they're gonna become more diverse. So if you take the view that we don't want anybody coming here, we wanna keep everything and everybody out, the changes that are taking place in the economy are gonna pass you by. And you're gonna be left in the dust. It's just what our friends in, in the world of ecology have tried to teach us for a long time. Monocrop culture and agriculture dies. It does not work. If you don't model your agriculture based on biodiversity, you're not going to last. And I think the same is true for human societies. So why don't we go to another question? Because we do have several. Um, can, you, can you describe the process for how to file a complaint when there is a fair housing violation? Like who is protected under fair housing laws? How do they file a complaint? And who's actually held liable for those violations? Judy, I can I can answer from the, the Arlington perspective, the town perspective first, and sure. others can speak to just more broadly the issues. 
Um, but the Arlington Human Rights uh, Commission, which is just arlingtonhumanrights.org, actually right on their right on their homepage, they have a button that says report an incident and it walks you through the steps that you need to take in order to report an incident of discrimination. Um, it also talks about on that same page, um, the process that they use, uh, the timeline that it takes to evaluate um, the report um, and other steps that are needed as part of the process. Um, so I would start there. If there is uh, an issue related to discrimination, the Arlington Human Rights Commission is tasked with addressing those issues and following up on those reports and incidents. Um, it's related to the protected classes in Arlington, which are the same protected classes that Judy and Diane and others have already spoken to, but that is, um, or those are race, color, religious views, national origin, sex, gender identity and expression, citizenship, age, ancestry, family, marital status, sexual orientation, disability, source of income and military status. Um, I've just read verbatim what's on the page, but so I would encourage people to take a look at that as well as the wealth of other uh, documents and information on the commission's page. And I'll defer to others if there's a, you know other things to add on to sort of that process of filing a report and what often happens, which I also think is sort of relevant um, in a way to that question. For example, dealing with MCAT or others. Right. Bob, did you want to add something? Yes, and this is important for anyone filing a complaint or dealing with Fair Housing Enforcement. The Fair Housing Act makes it very clear anyone, anyone can file a Fair Housing complaint. Whether you have suffered from discrimination directly or if you know of a situation that's about to happen that may involve a discriminatory act. Anyone can file a complaint as an individual, any church, any neighborhood association, any group can file a fair housing complaint. And uh, I know Diane, counselor, you, you're, you're familiar with this, but for the folks in the audience, we even have a federal court case, uh, Traficante versus Metropolitan Life, where the federal court backed that up and said that uh, folks who are not directly involved but indirectly involved can file a fair housing complaint. That's important for people in Arlington to know. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go on to another question here. Um, who, who would you recommend to do the kind of impact assessment for the town meeting warrant? Who's going to, who would do that? That was one of the recommendations in the Fair Housing Plan. And I'm wondering if there's a, you know, if what people think about that. Who should do that? Any thoughts? I can take a stab at this one, but I believe, um, you know, there will be other suggestions about ways to do this. And I think that you know, we would welcome a discussion about the process that we would use and how that would actually work, um, whether it would be sort of a, um, in part by the petitioner of the article, um, a committee or board that is charged, you know, with the, the with reviewing those articles, I would say that that could be perhaps something that's part, that assessment could be part of a report to town meeting. Mm -hmm. um, other bodies that make reports to town meeting might also perform the same assessment if they're looking at you know, financial decisions or um, or other decisions, not necessarily bylaw amendments. There are all different types of, of warrant articles proposed, of course, at town meeting. Um, so I think that it, it would be sort of a little bit the petitioner and then of course uh, a process by which we often go through of evaluating articles um, as part of the development of a report to town meeting. Um, and then of course, there might be another step in there, which I think um, is sort of uh, other groups that may want to weigh in um, we talked about the Human Rights Commission. There's likely other bodies that would have, that could have bring a significant voice to that conversation as well as observations and perhaps their own assessment. So I think that there could be a lot of ways to get at um, that sort of um, assessment or evaluation process. So even perhaps an assessment tool that an individual board or committee or someone who is proposing a warrant article could apply 
really in part as sort of a self-education process, but also to be thinking about that impact assessment as they're preparing a warrant article. Would that make sense as well? Potentially, yes. And I do uh, think that um, sort of a, a process of educating um, people who are participating in these town processes is something that we recommended in the Fair Housing Action Plan um, as well. So I think that it, it dovetails with some of the, the, um, the strategies that were discussed or the recommendations that Diane was suggesting related to town governance structure as well as processes. I think they all sort of fit hand in hand. Um, thank you. And then I see Bob. Yes, Bob. Um, when I read the Fair Housing Plan, at, at least a portion I was able to get through, uh, uh, it's a fabulous document. Um, it's really, really well done and really well thought out. But one, one of the recommendations I had right off the bat was that your Human Rights Commission, I think they should apply to HUD for certification so they can become substantially equivalent to HUD and therefore have all the enforcement powers of remedies and everything else that HUD would be able to render in any fair housing complaint process. And I think with that kind of enforcement power behind it, that should be the entity that would do the assessments. And if anything were out of line, uh, your Fair Housing Commission or your Human Rights Commission uh, could file its own commission initiated complaint if it felt it that the situation was really serious enough, enough, they could bring their own complaint. And I think that will make fair housing enforcement in Arlington really serious and people will take it seriously. So another question, um, and you know, Whitney, I might bump this one to you, and I, but I don't wanna put you on the spot. So if you're not comfortable answering, somebody else could jump in. But this is kind of a Massachusetts specific question. And that is, um, Whitney mentioned, and I've seen it in my practice over three decades, that one of the groups that particularly um, suffers from fair housing, from, from housing discrimination through land use laws is families with children. And I'm wondering what you think um, really anybody, but, but Whitney, I'm just, because you've been around so many communities and you might have some thoughts about this. Um, to what extent does reform of the whole school funding approach in Massachusetts have anything to do with this conversation? Or is that really just a distraction? I'm wondering what, what, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Judy, for that question. Um, uh, I've heard it said before from my, my mentor who's, on screen with me here, Bob, that, you know, really the budgets are moral documents, right? And, and sort of where you put your money and, and how you allocate that, um, how it's structured really speaks to sort of the intent, right? It's, it speaks to the heart um, in many ways, right? And so I think it's important as we think about Familial status, you know, families with children, you're thinking about schools, um, you're thinking about, um, you know, how funding gets streamed in and how schools are growing, what they have access to, right? It really gets back to our question about, you know, how housing is really interrelated to so many other aspects of our livelihoods, right? And so there, there's no way to really have the conversation about, uh, funding in schools with the schools without also talking about housing. It's just, it's just so um, interrelated. And so I think we have to lean into um, the conversations of, of really correlating those things together, mm -hmm. right? It, it has to, we have to be mindful about what those impacts will be for not only the community, but individuals who are looking to live in that community, for instance, as well. Um, and what it means for their families. Um, so yes, I think that it's important for us to really be thinking about what those potential impacts would be um, when implemented um, as it relates to housing and you know housing affordability. Like all, all of these things really, really do uh, overlap in many ways. Thank you. That's kind of my experience too, but I thought I would ask one of the pan one or more of the panelists. 
Anybody else have any thoughts? to hear what others others um, yeah. would add there as well. But I, I just I just think that it there's just we have to start thinking about these ways together, right? I think in the last year, right, we've we've gotten into our language that housing is healthcare, right? We we got it. Right. But we also have to be thinking about this when we think of these other equity lenses uh, in terms of transportation and jobs and access to healthy foods and, and, and schools. We have to start to continue to have this in our language as we look at these issues and how to solve them uh, overall perspective. Anybody else want to weigh on that or shall I go to another question? Because um, there are plenty here. So. Uh, an Arlington resident has asked, um, you know, how can Arlington find a community developer who will develop 100% affordable housing um, in Arlington? The, uh, the current inclusionary zoning policy uh, is ineffective and, and, you know, and some perceive it to be kind of abused by developers because a majority of the units in a given development can be kind of market rate. So um, how can the town engage a community developer who will do 100% affordability um, and what are your thoughts on that? Of course, I want to just recognize that Arlington has the Arlington Housing Corporation, uh, and I know that they do, they have done 100% affordable projects, but I'm just wondering kind of what your experience is, any of you, with a community trying to do, to reach out to more community development, CDCs or nonprofit housing organizations that will do that kind of development. Anybody have thoughts on that? I don't know, particularly know the development landscape there. Um, there's also been a trend towards mixed income development rather than 100% affordable housing for lots of reasons, but um, there have been a number of really, really successful mixed income developments. I know of all places, Santa Monica, which has an average home price of $2 million, has mandatory inclusionary zoning and you know affordable units are in these beautiful buildings by the beach and why not um, why shouldn't everyone have that opportunity so to have it mandatory inclusionary zoning as part of a larger development can sometimes make sense particularly in a hot market versus 100% affordable housing which requires a lot of deep subsidies i think mm -hmm. Um, Jenny, you could certainly mention, you know, discuss that aspect. Yeah, I'm glad to. Um, I, yeah, I think that to get 100% affordable housing, you know, has a little bit to do with the type of housing that we're talking about, but a lot to do with other issues, uh, the zoning, um, the potential site conditions, um, of course, the price of land, the price of construction, uh, of constructing whatever the building will be. Um, as well as many other contextual, you know, other variables uh, that are factored into any development um, opportunity. So I think it's 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 a it's a laudable goal and one that, of course, in partnership with the Housing Corporation of Arlington, the town is very committed to and has worked with them, for example, on two recent developments, including pro providing a significant subsidy um, to in order to make those developments move forward at. Um, one is at Downing Square um, in Arlington Heights, and the other one is in East Arlington along Broadway, for example. Um, and I, I think that there are many other opportunities perhaps in the future for, for other types of all affordable developments working with, with HCA, for example, as well as others potentially, um, including the Housing Authority is, a, is obviously an owner of all affordable housing and could potentially uh, choose to develop more affordable units in the future. Um, on their properties um, that they currently have, or perhaps others in the future. Um, those, are, those are options that other communities have engaged in to move things forward. But I would say that it's looking at the development, uh, other development variables that may get in the way of being able to develop a 100% affordable housing project. Um, and that goes back to part of what was embedded in the earlier part of the question, which is how our inclusionary zoning bylaw may or may not be effective. Um, and that is something that we will be investigating a little bit further as part of the development of the housing plan, um, which uh, we, we talked about a little bit earlier, but to dig into that one, um, it is not just about the bylaw, it's also about 
development. What are the opportunities? What are you seeing? Why are you seeing those types of proposals move forward? Um, but not just about amending the zoning. It's more, there's many other parts to why a development may or may not proceed. Uh, but we are very interested in trying to figure that out as well as encourage that all affordable housing that was mentioned. Uh, last thing I'll say is that City of Cambridge has put forward and was able to pass an all affordable uh, affordable housing overlay. Um, and that is something that I know uh, there's interest in exploring here in Arlington. Um, and I would say that that's, you know, again, in the same vein, they looked at some of the barriers in order to make it uh, happen and make it be um, to the point where now it is, of course, an overlay. It didn't amend the underlying zoning, but it's something that can float um, over various parcels with various um, incentives in order to be, to develop denser, uh, all affordable housing. So another question um, that's in the Q&A is, um, you know, other than state or federal action, are there ways to encourage development across all communities in a region? Rather than focusing on an individual community, just wondering what you think about regional approach versus local. Anybody have any thoughts on that? There may be an opportunity. Um, President Biden is is really promoting um, ways to incentivize zoning changes to make it less exclusionary, for example. And I know that there'll be some financial incentives and that might be something to look at across jurisdictions. Um, some jurisdictions do it really well and others not so much, but we have seen in other places, you know, sort of these regional housing coalitions that do joint development. Um, what's also important is that by merging with other jurisdictions on this approach, not just not in terms of government, to allow people from other jurisdictions to actually move to the other jurisdictions. And that's sort of part of the incentive to do regional collaboration on development. Thank you. I think one of the reasons this sometimes comes up in Massachusetts in particular is that chapter 40B um, is specifically applied to the individual city or town. So when you're a town that has a harder time getting to that 10% standard or whatever other standard in the statute you're trying to reach, um, you know, sometimes there's a feeling that perhaps regional solutions would make more sense. But the law itself very focuses, very much focuses on individual cities and towns. And I, I will just point out, because I think sometimes people forget, but Chapter 40B, the affordable housing law, is part of the regional planning statute in Massachusetts. So its origins are actually regional planning. Um, and I think it's maybe helpful to kind of bear that in mind. It also follows the Federal Fair Housing Act by about 15 or 16 months. So all of these things happened, not in a vacuum, but very much in relation to each other. Uh, another question here is... Um, Judy. Yes. Sorry. sorry. Um, I just want to recognize that Adam Chapdelaine, the town manager, was interested in also uh, providing a response. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Adam? Is Adam able to join the discussion? Um, we could forward the link so he can be able to. He he was on. I, I don't see him now. Um, so I'm not sure what has happened. And uh, perhaps we can bring him back if he sure. if he rejoins as a participant. Um, Jill Jillian can can let us know. Sure. That's Thank fine. You. Um, so another question that came up in the Q&A is, can you please pr place gentrification in this discussion? It's a challenge here in Arlington. Affordable housing is, is embraced. How do we preserve the naturally occurring affordable housing? Um, you know, stuff that's sort of historically kind of been affordable, maybe below market price. How do we keep that affordable? Thoughts on that? 
It's a strategy to preserve existing affordability that is not otherwise restricted by deed. Bob, did you want to comment? Yeah, the, the, the short answer is we, we've been, as I said earlier, in Boston, we've been fighting this issue tooth and nail, and not just for the last five or six years, but it seems like for the last three or four decades, there have been waves of gentrification that have come through. Um, about two years ago, uh, the Roxbury Neighborhood Council, a group that I'm a part of, uh, asked our city councilor uh, to have a public hearing in Roxbury about gentrification displacement. And uh, about 350 residents showed up, uh, 60, of you, uh, 60 of which testified. And we started off the hearing by giving our city councilors 31 recommendations for fighting gentrification displacement. Uh, and we refer to it as our Roxbury standards for community development. I would be glad to send that to you and have people in Arlington figure out which pieces of it would be applicable. One of the recommendations we made to take pressure off of our one to four family portion of the, uh, our housing market. You know, in Boston, they have this the way that they do our property tax assessments. You know, the assessor comes down the street, <laughs> looks at your building, then looks across the street and says, well, this person bought the building for a million dollars. So guess what? Your building is worth a million dollars. <laughs> and we felt that that was an unfair way and a crazy way to do assessments. We think each building should be assessed properly on its own merits based on what the person paid for it and what they've invested over the years in its maintenance and upkeep and then go from there uh, in terms of the assessment of the property. So we had that plus 30 other recommendations for pushing back against the gentrification wave. I'd be glad to send it to you. So I'm curious, what happened with all those recommendations, Bob? Well, we were shocked uh, because our, our city council uh, changed and we, we now have the most diverse city council in the history of Boston, uh, they actually began to take up some of these issues. Uh, that's why Lydia Edwards did what she did with our zoning amendment and bringing fair housing into our zoning code. Um, and also we began to do something else that we, we had done decades back, but we sort of renewed this as a strategy. Um, we started as a community negotiating with developers directly. And we said to them, um, you know, uh, we can have this tug of war if you want. Uh, it'll cost you more time, energy, and effort fussing with us than if you come to an agreement with us about what needs to be built. And over on Fountain Avenue, we got the developer to do almost 100% affordability, and there were home ownership units. Um, so sometime direct negotiation with the developers, with community folks, saying to them, this is the kind of housing we need in our community based on our income distribution, based on our needs. One of the pushbacks we had with all the developers, they were building micro units and studios and one bedroom units and two bedroom units. And we said, well, 80% of the folks in our neighborhood can't move in, even if we could afford it, because they're too small. <laughs> and we began to really pressure the developers and our city government about, well, if you're not building this stuff for the residents of our neighborhoods, who are you building it for and why? And that began to open up a whole different dialogue and also brought to light some fair housing issues. And slowly but surely, we began to uh, start seeing more affordability popping up in some of the units, I mean, some of the developments, but it's been a slow process. Thank if I may, uh, Judy, I I'm glad that this question really asked us to bring gentrification into the conversation. Um, when I think about gentrification and displacement, I, I'm remiss, I, I sort of have to think about communities in terms of 
uh, whether or not it's an inclusive community we're talking about or if we're talking about a historically exclusionary community, right? And so I think that when we talk about this, um, these terms in this context, we, we should be mindful as well um, about what it is we're talking about. I think in terms of the action plan and the work that you're doing and the assessment of fair housing, it's so important certainly to be thinking about what does it mean for uh, me for potentially as an Arlington resident to be able to live here and continue to live here and afford to live here and for my children and my grandchildren to be able to do so, my friends and neighbors. But also this context of creating a community that also allows for others who would like to live in our community to be able to do so as well, right? So um, sort of this, du this duality of the different types of communities that there are, but also thinking about what does that mean in terms of creating a balance, right? Being mindful of gentrification uh, and displacement in a community that has been historically exclusionary, maybe a different conversation than a community that is uh, sort of a more inclusive community, right? More diverse community. So I love that we brought that into uh, the conversation as we're also thinking about what does it mean to sustain um, affordable housing and create affordable housing and all of that in the context um, of our community, but it's important to do all of that good, great work and assessment in the context uh, of your community. But certainly there are things that we can learn from what other communities have been able to do and develop and adopt that can really help us in the, the efforts. And I, I might add that there are some um, shared equity models that seem to really work. So for example, um, there are a number of community land trusts that basically write down the cost of the land to make more affordable housing and allows residents to remain. There's also some, you know, limited equity co-ops and other kinds of home ownership opportunities for these residents that could really um, be effective. Thank you. I'm going to move on to another question. Um, so I'll summarize this because it's 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 kind of long, but and I have not fact checked the statistics in this, but I'll just read it, um, you know, out of honor to the person who posted it. Arlington's population declined from 53,500 in 1970 to 43,735 in 2020. The number of housing units is about 19,000, you know, this year. The number of units has increased, but household size has decreased over the past 50 years. A lot of Arlingtonians are concerned about density, but I believe the roots of tra our traffic and parking and school populations. Discriminatory, discrimination certainly exists in Arlington, but it may not be accurate to imply that NIMBYism or discrimination is the most prevalent barrier. I believe many Arlingtonians want both fair and for housing and quality of life in Arlington. What are your comments about how to bring these ideas into balance? Um, Perhaps better urban design would help mitigate some of the tension. What, what do you think about that? I realize that was sort of a statement more than a question, but it ends with a question. You know, what do you think about trying to bring some of these competing ideas and needs into balance? I guess I'll jump in there just to say that. Um, what I love about the question is it's asking about balance, right? And um, I think sometimes we can find ourselves sort of summarizing um, the ideals of um, residents in Arlington in one way, because oftentimes there are sometimes voices that are heard really loudly, right? How do you get the balance in that space about who shows up to public meetings and who talks about these ideas of wanting certain development and maybe having actual viable concerns about traffic and parking as opposed to, um, you know, as we see in so many communities that I'm working with, uh, oftentimes it's guised as parking, but it's really something else. 
Um, and so how, the, real, the real piece that I, I look at in terms of the question is really, how do you bring more voices to the table who care and love Arlington and sort of want those values that he talk about in this the question that was posed? How do you sort of allow for the real uh, balance of the voices that you're hearing um, in the community to come to the table, right? Um, and so I think that it's important to, to do the work that's necessary to make sure that there uh, is inclusivity in those conversations. And that takes real work, right? Sometimes that means providing translation. Sometimes that means rethinking when you're doing your public meetings and how is there a hybrid opportunity to do things virtually as well as in person? Uh, do you provide food and child? I mean, there's so many different things, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that the idea of really creating balance in those voices and then certainly being able to um, talk about what those real concerns might be in the community and really being able to allay fears that come along um, um, with that. So, great. Bob, did you want to add something? I, I think this goes back to the discussion we had about the, the new HUD reg and the use of the assessment tool to do assessments of fair housing. Um, it's not a complicated issue, but it is a complex one. Uh, with lots of moving pieces to it, moving parts to it. If we're concerned about density of either housing or population or both, um, and we say, well, we don't want density because folks will bring their cars and we'll end up with where do we put the cars? And now we have to have more land set aside for cars and we get more traffic. Okay, um, so then that means we need perhaps to look at our zoning code and lower the parking ratios instead of upping the parking ratios. Uh, some people up the parking ratios on multifamily housing to undercut the development. We've seen that tactic used over and over again. So, okay, if we're going to lower the parking ratios, well, then that begs the question, how are people going to get around? So now you have to look at, well, if you're not going to let them get around by car, is the town walkable? Can you use bikes or, better yet, public transportation? <laughs> so when you pull on one thread of the sweater, <laughs> another part of the sweater starts <laughs> to fall apart. That's why you have to have a conversation that's based on intersectionality. You have to see this as a whole and that the, the solutions are, are complex and varied. So maybe it's a thing of Arlington needs more public transportation and fewer cars. So no matter what we build, you know, increase traffic and more land devoted to park. Because I could tell you if they had thought that way in Boston, we wouldn't be inundated all day long with traffic everywhere. Right. And we're the fourth most expensive city in the country for parking. So let's take a look at our assessment tool. And as Whitney said, bring the parties together and negotiate. Thank you. Um, there's another question here that I think you folks might want to field. Um, person says, I, specific, I appreciate some of the specific recommendations that Diane has presented, but I question the value of enabling duplex units in single family zoned areas since Arlington and greater Boston generally is such an overheated high demand market. Unless the second unit is deed restricted to be affordable, won't it result in two upper limit households or units? In other words, all market rate at the highest level the market will bear. I, Jenny, I'm not sure if you want to go. I'll just take a quick um, stab. Um, 
That's true, but they could be deed restricted if, for example, if home funds might be used to create that, you know, the second unit or CDBG or whatever local funding, they could have a deed restriction. Um, with, for example, Massachusetts passed this aid um, allowing a new statute allowing um, accessory dwelling units. California passed the same one. Lots of um, states have past that. And what Los Angeles, for example, is doing is looking at providing um, low interest loans or grants to homeowners so they can add that unit and have it affordable to maybe an elderly person, a person with disabilities, or if it's large enough, a family. So there are somewhat creative ways using local resources to make that second unit affordable. Thank you. Does anyone else have thoughts on this? Um, let me see. Uh, one of the earlier comments or questions that came up was, uh, it seems like our town is progressive about this, meaning the fair, reference to the fair housing plan. And we had a progressive new possible set of zoning regulations and the community got to vote on it and voted it down. How is it that legal event that the more powerful, I, it's a little bit um, garbled question here, but how is it that some people can have more powerful than our federal obligation to promote fair housing? How is it that that the interests that appear to at least to this speaker to be antithetical to fair housing end up having more clout in the process than those who support it? It's really an institutional question, but I throw it to all of you. Well, I'll just jump in. I mean, I, I, I'll just go back to, it's kind of the answer to the to an, another question, um, which speaks to sort of this increased awareness, education, um, and making people understand or helping people to understand uh, the issues that we're talking about. And um, to Bob's point, the intersectionality of all of these issues. I think that the, that's really key to helping people make better decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that it speaks to um, the other pieces that we talked about in terms of the town governance um, and who takes part in some of the decision-making uh, with regard to the structure. So I, I think those are all things that to me intersect with outcomes um, potentially around fair housing. So the, the intention is both educational as well as a little bit of restructuring or rethinking. I think the word is alter in the plan, but rethinking of some of that structure towards decision-making and that would help perhaps generate some different outcomes. Do we have time, I think, for one more question, folks? It's 8.50, can we take one more? Okay, thanks. Um, with the formation of the Affordable Housing Trust uh, and the plan to fund it with a percentage of the sale price of houses, what recommendations would you make about how those funds should best be used to provide affordable housing and for whom? You know, such as questions such as, you know, what, um, what median income level should be targeted, et cetera. How could the town make the best use possible of that new Affordable Housing Trust Fund? I see smiling faces and no volunteers. Bob, do you want, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yes, I'll be brave and I'll, I'll dive in. Um, <laughs> um, well, one, one thought that came to mind immediately is to promote affordable home ownership. There's a tremendous amount of discussion now about closing the racial wealth gap um, throughout the country and one thought one strategy has begin, uh, that's been put forward is to push uh, more affordable home ownership. Um, you know, every time I hear these debates uh, throughout various parts of the state about who's moving in, who's moving out, uh, how many houses we should we build, et cetera, et cetera, multifamily housing. So I wonder what would happen if uh, people who had the income to get a mortgage and have the credit, what if they came in and started buying homes in these communities? 
I wonder if they would be the same rhetoric, the same objections, because now we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road. Is it the housing they're, that they're opposed to, or is it the people that would occupy that housing? So um, not, not to use uh, home ownership as a fair housing test case, I'm not suggesting that. Uh, I think you know fair, the pursuit of home ownership, particularly for people of color in this society, is crucial. And I, I would suggest that uh, the housing trust start there and, and build its way out. Any other thoughts on this before I turn this back to Jenny and Jillian to close up for the night? Looks to me like we're all set. Jenny, I think I pass this back to you if I'm not mistaken. Yes, um, and thank you. And thank you for that last question. I'll just answer also live here that um, we are developing the housing plan in tandem with once we actually have all of the trustees seated, uh, which has yet to happen on the, afford the Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Fund, uh, they will work to develop an action plan, which was be what was being referenced in that question. Um, in tandem with the housing plan that we're developing. So I think that there will be, again, some overlap there. But to speak specifically to fair housing um, issues that we've raised this evening, Bob mentioned one suggestion, and I'm certain that others will come up along the way as we begin the development of that process. Um, so I first just want to say thank you so much to the panelists for joining uh, tonight. Um, I'm so pleased with uh, this conversation and being able to uh, bring awareness to the issue of fair housing um, to Arlington and have people understand a little bit more about not just uh, some of the issues happening in Arlington, but how they relate to the greater Boston region. Um, also learn a bit about the various dynamics on this particular topic and the intersectionality of housing to so many other issues, um, affordable housing, fair housing. We covered a lot of different uh, aspects of this topic. And I think um, I personally have learned a great deal from the panelists as well. Um, I appreciate Judy for moderating this discussion. All of the questions that we had, I know that there are some additional ones. The Fair Housing Action Plan is on the housing section of the Department of Planning and Community Development's webpage on the Town of Arlington site. Um, and if anybody has any further questions, they can direct them to me at the Department of Planning and Community Development, um, and I will be very glad to answer anything in the future. I just want to say again, thank you to everybody for joining this evening. I think I'm going to turn it back over to Jill to close us out. Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you, everyone. Diane, Whitney, Bob, Judy, Jenny, you all were phenomenal. I just learned so much in the last two hours. Um, so I'm really grateful. And um, I'm happy that this conversation happened and I'm glad that the housing plan is available. So folks, like Jenny said, look, check, check it out on the website. Um, and I just wanna give a few more updates. So as we did last year with the community conversations, um, they will be paralleled by True Story Theater in doing some similar talks with what we're doing here. So um, next week, Tuesday, July 20th at 7 p.m., also over Zoom, um, will be their playback series, um, Who Can Live Here and talking about housing. So you can join that conversation as well to go a little bit deeper. Um, and as part of the community conversation series coming up in August on the 10th, our next topic will be listening to differing perspectives. So that's gonna be a conversation about the power of symbolism and its impact on us and you know the power of framing and what that really means. Um, so again, I just wanna thank everyone, thank our panelists for joining us tonight, everyone who attended. Um, this will be recorded and available and I do believe I'll double check with everyone but we might be able to pair those slides um, with the recording. So that will all be posted on the DEI uh, webpage on the town. So with that, I just wanna say thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Jill and your team. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Good night.